I'm not going to look at anybody who doesn't follow that instruction because, yeah. number one, they didn't read that. Yeah, that's the, right, yeah. Um, and so I was staggered. There was something like 40% of them didn't provide a didn't cover letter. Didn't provide a cover letter, no. I, I, I just, okay. Yeah. The job had, had an attention to detail mm. component that was really <laughs> so, yeah, important. Okay. Uh, yeah, definitely if you're looking for a creative failed. person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it wasn't a creative job where you can say, yeah, fine. Yeah, they, they don't attention to detail. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, now that's good. So it's always been my kind of philosophy. And I must admit, even just recently when I applied, I did, again, didn't get a recruitment agency involved, but I did do, uh, it was for an assistant role. Oh, yeah. And I actually had people turn up and they go, you know, they'd say, oh, well, have you seen my CV? It's like, well, you sent it to me, but I haven't read it. So you just tell me what you're about and we'll go from <laughs> So hello and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I'm joined in studio by Ian McGibbon, who is the founder and managing director of Farrow and Jamison, which is an executive research and recruitment business. Is that right? <laughs> that's, <laughs> Just that's checking my right. notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. excellent. Well done. Welcome to the studio, Ian. Really lovely to have you here. Thank you. So we've just been having a chat, as we always do before the podcast, for me to understand a little bit about your business. Um, and Farrow and Jamison has been around for a long, long time, originally founded by two people uh, called Farrow and Farrow Jamison, Jamison, strangely enough. But you took over the business back in 1987, has it? Yeah, 1987. So, wow. um, and, and to stay with the name, I'm not egotistical enough to make it Farrow Jamison and McGibbon. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, stay, stayed on and then uh, ultimately bought out uh, my partner in the business at the time and then expanded it mm. and expanded it a bit further last year with another acquisition. So, yeah. Yeah, you were, you were talking about planning on retirement that you bought another yeah. business, so I'm obviously not leaving anytime soon. <laughs> no, no. I, 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 I made a deal with my wife that, that said as long as I'm still having fun, yep. then it's all good. Okay. And if it starts to be a drag, then we'll have to look at things. But it's, yeah. I'm just having a ball. So that. Why I'm not? Pleased to hear it. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your journey to, to where you got to. I mean, how how did you get involved? Because this is not your original calling in life, is it? Uh, calling, no. <laughs> My calling was um, I went to Otago University. That's a calling. Yeah. Um, and did a, uh, a BA and a BCom and very cleverly couldn't put didn't get anything together, so I had to do them one after the other because there was no cross credits. Mm -hmm. um, so I was originally a marketer and did a marketing degree and was a marketer with Cerebus and then into Broadbank, as it was, with the old Broadlands. Um, and ultimately, they ended up uh, joining with uh, another person in an investment vehicle, which we put together and ultimately floated. But the trouble was we floated it in 1986. And in 1987, this little <laughs> thing called the share market crash happened. Let's remember that. <laughs> and, the, uh, and the shares that had been floated for a dollar were worth about 17 cents at the low point, I think. Right. Um, so ultimately what happened was we privatized it again and then over time um, sold it. And I was looking for something else to do oh. and uh, or a business to buy or a business to invest in. And I looked at all sorts of things. And then because of my wife's relationship with um, the executive recruitment world being a commercial psychologist, this opportunity came up. And I knew a little bit about these sorts of businesses, but not a lot, and um, got involved as a 50% shareholder initially and and loved it, just just loved it. Now, it's a very privileged, is a, is a word you can use, a very privileged position to be in, to be in discussions with boards and chief executives and um, C-suite people about, A, where they're going in their own lives, but mm -hmm. also um, where their businesses are going. And if you're business curious, like me, I'm business curious. I just I like yeah. to know what's going on with things. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is wonderful. It's so eclectic. You know, one day I'm dealing with a – a manufacturer of widgets, the next day you're dealing with a high-end service company, et cetera, and there's different dynamics. So I, I just found the whole thing endlessly fascinating and um, and turn around and suddenly you've been doing it for, you know, 30 years or something. Oh, yeah, well. <laughs> so there must have been some highs and lows throughout that time. Um, what, were the, what are your sort of – what are the things you're most proud of in the business sense and then also personally as well? Um. Well, number one, personally, I'm always you know, immensely proud of my family mm. and my, my wife. We've been married for 42 years. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Um, and you know, just had a, our wedding about our son and those sort of occasions are an absolute mm. reminder about what's important in life. Absolutely, um, yeah. Seeing you know, greater families together. And the business itself, um, yeah, lots, lots, of, lots of bumps in the road, always you know, making mistakes. Um, post- Post the um, GFC, 
um, for those who are not old enough, the global financial crisis. <laughs> I think most of my listeners uh, would understand that. Yeah. I think most of your listeners would be onto that yeah. one. I figured that executive contracting would come back first before permanent recruitment. Executive mm. contracting is where you hire someone to come in and do a specific piece of work for yep. a, you know, three months, six months. It might be to evaluate something or to look at a market or to do something. Mm. So I thought, yeah, yeah, this people will be cautious and what will happen is that they'll have this. So, so I invested quite heavily in, in executive contracting and blew about a quarter of a million dollars, I think, because <laughs> what happened was people went bang straight back into permanent recruitment. Really? Just hired people. I just did not see that coming. Yeah. No, um, I, w- no I wouldn't have, yeah. They just put the money down and said, we're off, yep. you know, we're hiring and we're going to go. Um, so that was a bit of a low point. Mm. I think the entry into the South Island, we entered the – the South Island market, um, because our North Island clients asked us to, basically. They wanted representation down there. But Christchurch is unique. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, we'd been in the market. Uh, well, we at this point, I think we've been in Christchurch for about 18 years. And in Christchurch terms, that means you're you just about newbie. out of short pants. Yeah, That's yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so no one really cared who Farrah Jamison was, and that's fine. We were there to really service our clients, mm. and we've kind of fixed that by our acquisition of a, of a genuine South Island powerhouse in Sheffield, South Island. Still keeping both brands operating differently in different oh, okay. parts of the market. That's we're not merging the brands. So. Yeah, no. um, so that entry into Christchurch was was um, was was a high. I think the. Um, Post, here's another earthquake story. So one of the things that really, um, visually, I can still see it. We were in the Forsyth Bar building in Christchurch. And the Forsyth Bar building is the building that stayed up, but it went left, went right, stood up, and the entire center core collapsed. So all the stairwells were a hole. There was just a hole Mm. in the middle of the building. Everyone was trapped on all their floors. They could not not leave leave the building. So my staff were were trapped. And... um, and I should at imagine the, absolutely petrified at that point. Because, absolutely petrified yeah. because they could see the CTV building on fire. Oh, wow. So they knew that if their building caught on fire, that there's nothing it. they can do. Yep. And at the time, we were using Blackberries. And Blackberries <gasps> were Blackberry. the only – all the comms had gone down, but yep. Blackberry Messenger was working. Mm. Don't know how. They've got a secret source. Secret source, source. wow. <laughs> so I was, I, somehow it got out that I had access to the building. I was going – so I was getting these calls from Australian news media saying, you're talking into the building. How can you – anyway, my, my team were ultimately rescued by a crane with a cradle up to their external balcony, and they hopped into the cradle and then got down. Luckily, everyone's safe. Yeah. But two doors down from us is, is a lawyer, and he had uh, two floors down from him was the external car park, which is a raised car park. Mm-hmm. And there's a photo of him going down the outside of the building with the rope with a server under his arm. And his rationale was, this server is my business. If I don't take this, I do not have a business. And at that point... We transitioned the entire business into cloud computing before cloud computing became a thing. And yep. The wonderful, wonderful day where I actually uh, took a, a sledgehammer to the server room and demolished it. So, um, so my team was ultimately uh, rescued by a, a crane and a cradle mm. that came up to their balcony and they climbed in and landed. Actually, another funny story that that we had a client interviewing a candidate. Um, and these oh, poor people the were, at the time, they oh. were stuck in this, and he didn't get the job, which is even worse. Oh, no. <laughs> they got to know each other perhaps a little too well over yeah, the yeah. course of that four hours and maybe figured the chemistry wasn't right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the, this lawyer who was two floors down was broke a window, put a rope out of the window and clambered down this rope two stories to his car park with a server under his arm his computer server, and on the basis that um, this was his business and he had no business with you know, if he didn't have this. And I was looking at this, this is bonkers. This is absolutely madness. <laughs> and so we had just been playing around. The cloud computing hadn't become a thing, but we were just playing around. Anyway, it started a journey where we just transitioned everything into the cloud, and I was able to finally demolish the server room and the server rack and all that stuff, mm-hmm. which meant that when – COVID happened, the lockdown, the impact for us was almost zero. We could instantly actually work from home, 
we were already doing that. We already had all our video stuff set up, et cetera. Yep. And as it turned out, people kept hiring. Yeah. And so we were able to maximise that and that opportunity. So anyway, lots of, yeah, lots yeah, of lots different Yeah, lots of little things that happened on the way. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Um, that, that earthquake was just, um, was something else, wasn't it? It was something that never never happened before. I, I tell you what, um, I, I go to Christchurch quite regularly, obviously, yep. I was down there each month for a few days. Last week I was down there on a Tuesday night mm-hmm. and we couldn't get into the first four places we wanted to go out oh, really? dinner at six o'clock. We yeah. thought we'll go early because we go to such a... <laughs> Christchurch was humming. Yeah, absolutely. To be humming. fair, though, it's tough because I also get on regularly. I've got clients down there. It takes it's been taken. It has taken a long time to yep. actually get back up to that. I remember going sort of you know a couple of years afterwards and looking around and really it felt like nothing had changed. No. And then all of a sudden it just started. And I think the new the new buildings like the residential buildings that they're building in the city centre um, in those areas has really changed the whole dynamic of, yeah. of Christchurch and the convention centre. Yes, yeah, a I went to the convention centre just recently. Yeah, okay. yeah, they the convention. Yeah, it does work. So mm-hmm. no, I'm. I'm we were early back there in Christchurch. We wanted to support Christchurch, mm-hmm. um, but for a while there, uh, I'd be visiting and I was uh, in the central city more than my staff were because they just got used to not ever going back to the central city. But yeah. it's it's broken down now. No, it's good. It's really good. Mm-hmm. I think we've seen something similar in Auckland, haven't we, with, with COVID? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that we almost got used to not going out. Yep. Um, I don't know. It's taken a long, long time for the... Um, the hospitality industry to actually recover from that. Yes, and some I, haven't, I sadly. I, some, some some didn't. I mean, we lost no. some iconic kind of brands in that time. Absolutely. I know yeah. um, a guy who owns a, a coffee chain, and he said the central city ones have really struggled, but the mm. suburban ones have exploded. It's people oh, really? working remotely, and now they're meeting. Yeah, going yeah, meeting at the cafe. Yeah, that's okay. Makes perfect sense. Mm. Cool. Okay, so when we were talking before we came on the podcast, you know, you talked about the fact you've got lots of different clients. So you do everything from corporate right the way through to, um, I guess, well-financed startups. But there is a, a sweet spot in terms of those established businesses, sometimes privately owned. And that's the sweet spot for me. I work with privately owned established businesses. And I know that, you know, sometimes there comes a point where it is time for them, where they know they're no longer the right person to be the person running the business. Mm-hmm. And they might have reached that point themselves or more than likely they their husband or wife has had a bit of a word to them about, you know, I'm <laughs> um, not seeing very much of you and I'm really getting a bit concerned about this. You need to do something about it. And then they come to you and they go, right, we need someone to run the business. Um, what is, tell us some stories about that because I think that would be really interesting for the, the listeners who are potentially thinking about the, these things. The, yeah, and supposedly, according to MB, there's a massive chunk of the population of ageing founders who yep. um, are looking for exit. And... Um, the reality is either their next generation of not children, interested. whatever, not really interested. Yep. Um, quite like the dividend check, don't so much like <laughs> the, the, work. Know, the, the work they're <laughs> yeah. doing. Um, but also, in their heart, they don't really want to, to sell out. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's a, a process of saying, do you put someone else to run it and you become an investor? Yeah. And if that's true, uh, what's an investor look like? Mm. They don't know. They've been a founder owner. They don't really know what an investor does. Yep. And so, you know, um, you can kind of play this game with them uh, where you actually uh, try and get them to approach their own job with two hats. One is the CEO of the company, and I'm talking to you as the CEO. Mm-hmm. And then the other one is the founder, is the um, shareholder. Yep. So now let's talk about a shareholder. Would you invest in this business? Mm-hmm. Tell me about the sort of things that you'd look at. And sometimes when you force them to look at it from a different angle, yep. they admit things that saying, oh, yeah, well, you know, we're a bit light in this area or a bit here. Because now they are trying to think like a shareholder. Yes. But the the real question you're, you're getting to is when do they know that it's time to let go? Mm. And then if you're doing that process, how do you do it without the the wheels coming off? Yeah. Because there is a litany of mistakes and stories of people who've who've got it wrong. You know, they bring someone in who's a hot shot, and then you know a year later, it's just a disaster, and yep. it costs everyone lots of time and money. And and part of that is actually trying to clarify what everybody's expectation is in here. Mm. And, I, and when, when this happens, I'm talking to candidates in the much the same way. Uh, you know, so what I'm saying to a candidate for a CEO job, where the CEO is stepping back and going to be a chairman and have a board, etc., is number one: tell me about the structure of your board. Yep. So, 
uh, you've currently got on your accountant and your lawyer. Well, guess what? They're service providers. They're, they're, they, they're, they're they almost yes your, people, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, they depend on your business for, for an income. Now, they might yep. be great people, et cetera, but the reality is they're less likely to challenge you and actually say, we need to justify something. Mm -hmm. um, they'll try and help you cover your checks, maybe not make not so many mistakes. So where's your board and expertise in terms of things that will genuinely challenge you and provide the discipline. I had a client of mine who's a very, very wealthy man, um, but at one point in time was a wealthy man with a lot of debt. Right. Um, and he sold out very well. And he said, the biggest problem for me post selling out was I lost my discipline because the debt in the bank was a discipline. Uh -huh. And I had to report, and I had the covenants, and I had this, etc. And he had a portfolio of companies, mm -hmm. some of which he still owned afterwards. And he said, the thing when I didn't have that is the discipline of the debt was suddenly one of the companies say, look, with just another one and a half million, we could do this. And the next <laughs> one's just leaking a bit now, but it'll be ready in the next year. It'll be fine, it's all going to be great, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he said, I, I realized afterwards it was all that discipline that comes from debt. So mm. how do you create discipline? Uh, when you're a founder, you, unless you're unique, and a few of them are, most of them will do what they instinctively feel like, but mm -hmm. don't really have the discipline about robust decision making or holding yourself to account. Yep. And so, who's going to provide that discipline for you on the board? Because the other part of the discipline is now tell me what you're stepping back from mm -hmm. and what you're doing. You say you're not retiring, you're going to be the chairman. And so, are you shifting offices? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I'll keep my office where it is, et cetera. <laughs> oh, okay. So, everyone who's used to that worn carpet to go straight to your office yep. is still going to go straight to your office. Mm. How are you going to deflect that, etc.? So you have to shake up some of those things and say, okay, I'm going to have someone on board and they're going to be in that office and I'm going to be um, working from home but in the office two days a week or something. It'll drive you nuts for a while, <laughs> yep. but you've got to create this break. break boundaries. Where, yeah. where there's these new boundaries. Mm -hmm. And the ones who do that well – um, their shoulders lift, they enjoy life, they enjoy their family more because they, they know they haven't given up on their dream, the dream is still there. Mm -hmm. Someone else is just taking it to the next level because maybe they don't have the skill to move from a $20 million to a $50 million business. Yeah. Yeah. It's just not their gig. Or, I mean, sometimes they are burnt out because of the number of hours they've been doing and, and so that you can't see the wood for the trees because you are just so busy in the business rather than get, being able to take an objective view from looking outside. So, Yeah, yeah. I'm su supremely client-focused. Good. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, it means I spend seven days a week, 24 hours a seven, and the phone's always on. Yeah. Really? You know, is that important? Uh, is that the differentiator? Are the client's mm. going to be fine if you come back to them tomorrow? Yeah. Um, you know, we have this thing about emails you know, at night. Um, and I try and say to my team, look, there's some times when actually you do need to jump on the tools because of a mission critical thing. Mm. Uh, but most of the time, Forget it. Yeah, you know, nobody's going to die if you don't answer that email. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think, uh, to be fair, as a as a visionary and sort of founder myself of several businesses, I've been guilty in the past. Yeah. I, I don't ever switch off. And so I will often send emails when I'm thinking about something. But that's a real challenge because that means that the person receiving it thinks they should respond. I don't expect a response from them. Mm. I just want to get it out of my head and send it off. <laughs> um, but, of course, if, you know, if you've got somebody working for you, if you get an email from the boss, they're going to think they have to respond. So yeah. you'll be very careful. Your behavior can can actually create, even not intentionally, an environment where people are responding after hours on the weekend, et cetera. Yes, and, and some of that um, is, I mean, you might say that wasn't my intention, mm. but if you are, have you asked them mm. about when I send you something at night, what's your expectation around that? Yeah. Um, just to make sure. Oh, no, we, we know you're just clearing your head. Oh, cool. I just, that's fine. Then yeah, I just yeah. want to make sure. <laughs> and you do, and you try and sort of say, hey, look, listen, I don't want you to answer on the weekend or, or whatever. And then I get so my, my current assistant, Denise, I mean, she often responds. I go, what are you doing responding to me? You know, I don't expect a response. <laughs> yeah. It's just me getting stuff out of my head. But yeah. I try uh, and do the same with. Um, with Outlook. I knew I had a problem with Outlook when I've got two monitors yep. and Outlook was on the left-hand one and my main working one was on the right-hand one. And I got a crooked neck. Because you were always 
yeah. I was looking this way. Yeah. And so I said, okay, so I'm turning off, turn off notifications, mm-hmm. um, minimize Outlook, et cetera, yep. and then just work on the other things and then have things that prompt you to say, hey, do you want to check your emails, yeah. et cetera. Have you managed to do that well? Nope. Okay, because I was going to say, I've, I've tried because I'm the same. I've, I've, yeah. heard, I've heard of people that actually only answer their emails twice a day. Mm. I can't believe it, it's, but I've heard of it. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. looking through. I, I, was, I tried for a while. I did this whole Inbox Zero thing. Oh, yes, I tried that for a while yeah. too. Yeah. And then and then the stress of getting the Inbox Zero was worse than the stress of having yeah. a whole lot yeah, of like, other things. Yeah, like, well, okay. <laughs> but I think I've got better at it. I think the one thing I have done is I've got, I have turned off notifications, particularly yeah. on my phone. I've noticed that not yeah. having that red circle that pops up that says that there's something there waiting for you on social media, on email, on all those things, is just means you then get to choose when you go in and look as yeah. opposed to being drawn by that. <gasps> yeah. Otherwise, so we use yep. um, Teams, and so oh, yep. we use the chat function. It's a bit like a Slack type um, thing, and so you know we find that's the easiest way to communicate because mm-hmm. you're not sending an email or writing with you're just just saying, "Hey, if that happened, yep, it's all under control." Yeah, correct, sorted. You yeah, know, we yeah. actually use Slack with EOS, which is which is the same sort of thing, and it's also good for searching back on things as well. I find trying to try and find things in emails can sometimes be a bit of a nightmare, whereas if you've got your Slack channels, your team channels set up, it makes it a little bit easier. Yeah, I think yeah. my 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 hang up is normally around expectations. Um, <laughs> you know, I have an expectation that something's going to happen instantly. Um, <sighs> Oh, surely not. Surely not. <laughs> yeah. you know, I've turned it. We, we just shift houses and shifted houses, and and there's a few things to do in right. the house. So I'm now DIY at our holiday place and up here. Mm-hmm. And my, I give my wife a hard time because she has this thing of how hard can it be? Yeah. Like we could do that. And how hard can it be? And I'm going, well, actually, <laughs> quite hard as it turns out. Yeah, hire somebody to do it. Okay. Yeah. But I quite enjoy fiddling. Yeah, yeah, me too. Okay, cool. So, so we're talking about we were talking about you know looking for if you've made the decision that you actually do not want to be involved in the day to day business but still want to be part of it, which I think a lot of people don't think is an option, but it's a really great option because if you get the right person there, you can literally just have that sort of governance role, shareholder role, rather than actually working in the business. But once you've made that decision, it's a hard one to make. Um, how do you work with them to help them find the right person? So if they've got their head in the right space and they know that that's what they want to do, how do you work with them to find the right person? What are the things you're looking for? How, what's the process? Um, so first you've got to try and figure out, are they just trying to back away from uh, something that's just causing them to burn out? Mm-hmm. In other words, they want someone to manage the business. Yep. Or are they genuinely missing out on opportunities where the business could grow, but but they don't have the fire or the expertise to do it? Yeah, because um, that's fundamentally a different thing. About you know, one of them's I just need to be able to unplug and sleep at night and mm-hmm. um, know that the business is ticking over and doing okay. So once you figure out what that is, um, and in the scenario where actually I've, I've I'm seeing all these opportunities in the market, but I just can't get to them. Mm-hmm. Then I'm looking for somebody who can um, land those sorts of opportunities. And so that's about um, business case, evaluating something and saying, yeah, can we do it? Mm-hmm. And then the question you ask the founder at that point is saying, okay, that's the engine that drives that is cash. So you tell me about what you need out of this because um, – you can't go down that track and you want to go and buy a new $15 million launch. Mm-hmm. What, what's your need? What do you want to do? If you want a new launch, that's fine, but that means we're now going to change what we want to do in the business. Yep. And so fundamentally, if they're sitting there and they've got the batch, the BMW, and you know, all you know, the bits they wanted, yeah. the, <laughs> um, then you can make some decisions about saying, okay, if, if the business needed – two, three, four million to actually start to achieve these next goals. Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. I'm prepared to commit that. We just need enough to live on. Okay. Now you can start to define the person and then you say to them, okay, so the next thing you want to do is if you are backing off to this bit, what's your role look like uh, as you envisage it? And therefore, what do you need to fill the bits that you can no longer do. Mm. So that you, you, they'll never write their own job, job description. They've never probably written a job description in their lives. They're never going to do this one. <laughs> but but you can help them sort of spec out 
what does that look like? Uh, does that look like you want two days a week off? Mm-hmm. Or does that look like you just want the stress off and you need someone to drive it? And, and you want to be, let's call it the passenger, but that's not fair. Yeah. And so once they understand that, well, the, the reason to try and spend so much time doing that is like you can't, if you can't articulate that, you can't tell the potential candidate about the risks. Right. Because smart candidates will come in and say, how much prep has this guy or girl yep. done about really exiting the business? Mm-hmm. Because here's the war stories. You yes, know, come I've in here and <laughs> suddenly someone's, you know, like the old days. I, I remember this in the days of fax machines. Oh, yes. This is a guy who was a chief executive of a good business. He had the fax machine inside his office oh, so no. he could see everything. Everything that came through. Yep. That's yep. a little bit not letting go, isn't it? And it's just like <laughs> when you walk into his office and the alarm went off in my head, I was just yep. going, What's this freak. doing here? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I like to keep an eye on it. So he's – that, yeah. Mm. So there's lots of clues about really how genuine someone is about letting go. And then um, you've got to be a truth teller to the person coming into the role by saying, here's what I think the challenges will be. Mm. They have said all these things. Yep. I believe them. Yep. But it hasn't happened yet. Right. So yeah. we're all going to take a leap of faith here. Mm-hmm. But here's what I think you can do to try and mitigate that. And and sometimes that's about um, the board, creating a board if they haven't got one. Yep. Um, and there's lots of different options you can do um, to do that in terms of putting something together. Just a governance board that will provide some of that discipline, mm-hmm. but also provide a bit of an area where they can air some of this. Right. Because some of it will get tetchy because there'll be things where – Someone passionately believes that they want to do it and a founder passionately believes that it's the dumbest idea he's ever heard. Or not the dumbest, but yeah. it's just not going to work. And so they have to find the mechanisms to work through that. Mm. And the, the final bit is, which they don't like very much, is um, so what's the divorce look like? Yeah. If this doesn't work, how are you going to get out of it? Mm. Because to get this guy, you promised a bunch of things. You, know, yep. you promised um, some shares or you promised down the track to, to look at something and and suddenly you don't deliver on that then you know, things go feral then things go legal then yeah. things get really messy, really messy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it costs everyone time and money and um, so yeah plan, plan the divorce before the marriage yeah and i think a lot of people think that's a real negative way but i actually believe if you have a plan b mm-hmm. um, and you know that it's in a drawer somewhere that you can access if need be then it gives you a lot more confidence in terms of executing on plan a yeah and and, and so um we'll give you you know shares in the business for, i mean why anyone wants i was going to ask you about shares that's my next question is like what do you think about giving shares but anyway right. <laughs> I mean, personally, I, I, the minimum I've owned in a business is 50%. Right, yeah. Um, but I, I get it if someone wants to come in, but um, agree what the valuation methodology is. Mm. And it's going to be based on um, EBIT or on asset growth or on whatever it is. And yep. everyone knows what the lever is. Yeah, so you've got your measurables, you know what it looks like, that's it. Yep. You move the dial mm-hmm. from 8 to 10, you get rewarded for it. Yeah. Um, well, the cynical chief executive says, well, you know, two years down the track, I get I get the opportunity to buy into the business. I've put two years in and I have moved the dial. Mm-hmm. And now, now the shares are worth that. more. The yeah. shares are worth more. Yeah. And the founder says, yeah, but that's what you're paid to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, so you being really clear it. in the beginning what that might look like yeah. in terms of, yeah, that's fair enough. And I also think there's an option to kind of, um, there's a, almost like a pathway because you can do B-class shares fairly easily mm. and, and a profit share even if you don't want to do shares. Mm. Um, and that gives an opportunity to reward sort of the good the good work, if you like. But I think when you start giving shares in the business, it's like a marriage, right? You're going into this, something that is now becoming a wee bit more serious than just dating or you know, getting Absolutely. engaged. You're now actually committing to something long term. <laughs> and you, I've been there, I've been discussing with, with uh, a company where the three of them in the business and two of them regard number three as a drag, mm, yeah. but number three owns 20%. And so they can outvote the person, mm. but the reality is board meetings are horrific. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so deal with it. Yeah. 
I've, I've had a couple of clients where they've had some of the things, but with even more shareholders. And so you've got a couple that are just um, almost like a, a rotten apple in the in the governance side of it, but also because they have a day to day job in the business as well, they start to affect the the entire culture of the business. Um, and so they're only minority shareholders, but the impact that they have um, can still be huge, even though they actually can't make the decisions at the board. Yeah, for some reason, some people regard their, their guerrilla tactics as being an honourable thing to do. You know, it's my, it's my job to actually um, point out some narky thing in here that actually has no relevance to the business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yes, yeah. Uh, plenty of those going through. And that's about also making sure that um, not only on the board, but you surround your – I've always had a view that you surround yourself with people that are smarter than you are. Mm. And, and uh, for a founder – that's often quite difficult <laughs> yes <laughs> because people have praised you for a long time about your vision and your energy and your and how amazing you are you've got yeah. the superman yeah. complex right yes. you can walk into the room and things happen mm -hmm. um, and suddenly you're not the superman anymore mm. you're, you're just the, the guy yeah and I think it's because there's a couple of things going on. So there's, there's that side of it. And then there's also, this is this is your baby. You know, you have literally, um, I mean, if you think about you with Farrah Jamison, you know, you took it from um, whatever it was when you started to where it is now. You've you've seen it grow. You've seen it go through its cycles, through its teen years, through its, hmm. you know, grown up stages. And then all of a sudden you're saying, hey, now you look after it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think um, there's... Mm, <laughs> There's a lot of things said about that, and you hear it a bit. This is my baby, but when you talk to them, mm. that's not true. Okay, that's not true. That's ego, um, and and it's not because uh, they are, are passionate that someone will hurt. You know, I, I view when someone says something is emotional. This is my baby. Yeah, it's a view of protection and and hurt. it's like a family thing. It's a protection. Yeah. You'll hurt it, etc. But when you really get to it, that's not it. it okay. It's actually, this is mine. Right. Just take the baby out of it. <laughs> yeah, this yeah, yeah. So it's actually mine. So I own it. <laughs> now, this is sharing yeah. in the sand part. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, I have to learn to share. Yeah. Okay, we'll take you <gasps> back. From only to child to suddenly having another. <laughs> yeah, that's a much better analogy, isn't it? Yeah. Sibling stuff. <laughs> yes, yeah, sibling. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> hey, look, I am sure we could talk all day because I'm sure we've got lots of war stories we can share, but sadly we have got limited time and I want to extract some more gold from you. So um, you've been through a lot, both in terms of owning your own business but also working with others uh, in their business. What are the three kind of top tips that you would share with people listening in? Um, uh, well, I don't think I have the, the arrogance to sort of say, here's, here's the sermon from the mount. Um, <laughs> no. What I can say is that um, – I think discipline is one of the things that, that is vital to a business mm -hmm. at all levels. And um, and if you don't create it for yourself, and so, look, I'm, I'm not that great at discipline. I'll fly off into lots of things that interest me, et cetera, but I have a board that creates discipline. Yeah. So if you can't do it for yourself, go and find it. Yeah. That'll actually create it. And I think, I mean, obviously a board is great from that governance perspective. Obviously EOS is a model that we use in terms yeah. of the operational um, inside the business, an operating system that gives you a framework. And I think particularly for entrepreneurial types, it's not trying to stop them from having those amazing, crazy ideas, and fight, but it's about yeah. actually putting some structure around it so that others around them can get the best out of them. <laughs> Absolutely. <Yep. laughs> and, and I think, um, so the discipline is there. I think uh, New Zealand's number eight wire, uh, people hold that up and saying, you know, we're amazing number eight wire. I think it's held us back. Um, <laughs> I'm so pleased to hear that because at the moment I was thinking a few conversations with people. I think that um, it's great that we can be a little bit sort of ingenious and, and kind of creative, but I also think it sort of gives us a small um, – small picture, like rather than big picture thinking, it's yeah. like, well, we have to do it ourselves. And it's like, actually, let let go. Let somebody else who's a specialist in that do that and you do what you're really, really good at. Absolutely right. And mm. that's exactly what I think, so that um, that too often we said uh, to ourselves, look, I'll figure it out. It'll be yeah. cheaper. I'll have to do it through and you do a half-pie job. Where, yep. where someone else can come in, they do it better, it'll be sustainable and it'll be better than you could ever do it. Yeah. Now, if you want to faff around and actually do that, that's fine, but yeah. don't hamper the business by doing that. No. Uh, go and find another vehicle like DIY. Um, <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> so, um, so be careful about um, the sort of, and, and it, yes, it costs money, but use impact players, you know, either contractors mm -hmm. or people you know can come in and actually make a difference and, and um, 
and and go and all of that stuff about fail fast if it's not working you know get rid of it Shift move on, on. yeah i was talking with someone at microsoft um asia pack once and he said new zealand is pretty much unique in uh, around the their globe in microsoft um because we don't kill projects oh really they say right oh, that's not going to work and we kill it and he yep. said next minute well four months down the track it pops up again someone's been quietly working away <laughs> and i think that's so true about our psyche we, we don't mm. we're not hard enough to say that is not a runner yep. kill it yeah we go oh, well it's not right we'll just show we'll we'll, yeah again. well we'll pivot a wee bit and we'll come yeah. back to it you yeah, know that's um, okay and also i think that um it there's a really great book by Dan um, Sullivan, who's a strategic coach. He talks about who, not how. Mm. So it's like rather than worrying about how you're going to do it, just go and find somebody who can do it, whether that be a, a business partner, whether that be somebody you're going to a strategic partnership with, or just an expert that will actually do it in a fraction of the time that it will take you. And yeah. sure, there'll be a cost associated, but what is the cost of time in your business? What's the cost of your time in the business as well? Yeah. Absolutely right. And the, and that really gets down to the sort of hiring great people. I mean, I'm in the people business, so of course. <laughs> of course, yeah, no, definitely. Big people's huge. But yeah. hire smart people. You yeah. Know, hire, hire people who – we're in a real real struggle in New Zealand at the moment in that we we gave up training essentially I think for twenty years mm -hmm. because we could bring in talent at the level we wanted and now mostly we can't and so we have to train again but it's like turning on the training switch how are we training people again yeah. hire for the uh, the attitude and the ability to learn mm. and then teach them yeah. Um, or get them the skills or let them watch a YouTube video which will probably tell them everything they need to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but let them grow and then train them to the next job. I mean, mm. you know, we, we we could essentially hire in at the levels we wanted to and now we can't because they're not available. So we're going to have to hire at the level below and let them grow into the job by training and mentoring. And, and so there's much more effort around that training and mentoring. Stop thinking about saying, I need someone to come and do that job 100% today because mm. it's unlikely to happen. Yep. Go and find someone who's got the most fabulous attitude and is a culture fit for the business and will learn how to do the 100% of the job yeah. and it might take them a year to get there. Mm. In the meantime, they're just adding value to the business by being energetic and culturally aware of what they're doing. Yeah, I must admit, I was working with a large corporate um, some time ago and they didn't use a recruitment agency, which was really disappointing. So whenever I was trying to build my team, I had to go through the internal kind of recruitment thing. And um, they would have some criteria around what level the job was, what skills they had to have. Were they uh, A certain level had to have a degree. And, and I have lots of degrees. So I'm not dead set against degrees, but I don't believe they add a huge amount of value. I actually believe attitude is the, is the key thing. And so they would send me through CVs and, and I would just keep rejecting them because I go, there's nothing in here that excites me about this person. <laughs> and, but, you know, and, and said, so show me the rejects. I mean, you can't see the rejects. I want to see the rejects. And to be honest, I never look at CVs. The most important thing for me was always the covering letter. Bingo. Because I reckon CVs are bo bollocks, if I'm honest. That's an English-British term, technical British term. Um, you know, anybody can make a CV look great. But it's actually, if you get that generic cover letter that goes, dear Mr. or Miss Elder, or dear Sir or Madam, and I'm really excited about your insert job from insert company and all the rest of generic, you kind of go, this person cannot even be bothered to make an effort with a cover yep. letter. What on earth are they going to do when they, when they work for me? Yep. <laughs> so. I used to push back against the HR department and go, give me the rejects. I'd look at the cover letters and I'd get people on base on that. And then I'd, it would be the interview. I would never even look at their CV. Um, just talk I to them, find out what they did. Um, yeah. For someone, I said, look, if you're applying for this job, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write a cover letter and mm. I want you to cover these two points. And um, and I'd set up to the, um, the my team. I said, I'm not going to look at anybody who doesn't follow that instruction because, yeah. number one, they didn't read the yeah, That's the, right, yeah. Um, and so I was staggered. There was something like 40% of them didn't provide a didn't cover Didn't provide a cover letter. No, I, I, thought, I just, okay. yeah. The job had, had an attention to detail mm. component that was really <laughs> important. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, definitely if you're looking for a creative failed. person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't a creative yeah. job where you can say, yeah, fine. Yeah, they, they don't want attention to detail. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, now that's good. So it's always been my kind of philosophy. And I must admit, even just recently when I applied, I did, again, didn't get a recruitment agency involved, but I did do, uh, it was for an assistant role. Oh, yeah. And I actually had people turn up and they go, you know, they'd say, oh, well, have you seen my CV? It's like, well, 
you sent it to me, but I haven't read it. So you mm. just tell me what you're about and we'll go from there. <laughs> nice. I like it. But I do actually, I, I have some, I think I shared with you when I first came to New Zealand. So I'm not a, a native New Zealander. I came from um, UK and then through Australia and then to here. Uh, my first recruitment agency experience was with Sheffield. And, and certainly I believe that nice. good recruitment agencies, I'm not sure they're there anymore, but they can add a huge amount of value because they actually took the time to get to know me. They, yep. they didn't look at, you know, they didn't put me into a box. I think sometimes people can kind of go, you fit this box. And so <laughs> therefore, you know, this is the only role we put you forward for. They were, um, they took the time to actually, you know, look at what uh, nice. executive position I could go into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. I, um, so tell me a little bit about, so what does a good recruitment or recruitment search agency look like? Um, so uh, we, we're in a um, unique position of, of we have uh, optics both ways in the sense that we're talking to a client company and trying to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Here's the brief, a bit like a CV, yeah, yeah. whatever. <laughs> Tell me about what you really need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and one of those sorts of things is that people rattle off all these things that they require and, and then um, – so I might say to them, okay, so in 12 months' time, we hire this person in 12 months' time – you're saying, Ian, we've got to go out for lunch because this has just been fantastic, the best person I've ever had in the business, and she's just a superstar. Yep. What have they done? Yep. Oh, um, well, what I really want, and then they'll start to tell you what the real issues are that they want to address, not what's on the job description. Right. But, you know, I really want them to deal with the um, culture in this part of the business mm -hmm. or whatever. Okay, so <laughs> now I need to know what some person can do. Mm -hmm. And most people that I interview in C-suite type roles are not pr <laughs> they're not serial interviewers, but they know how to be interviewed. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Give me an example of, and, mm -hmm. and I'll play my. And so my going to them is that look, um, you're good at this. You know, you're obviously a, a, a good candidate. We're, we're not looking for somebody who is a really good candidate. We want a really good employee mm -hmm. for the business. And to do that, I need to ask about you. I want to know about you. And so we'll just leave the business things for a while. Let's tell them talk about you. And it makes some people quite uncomfortable. Mm. Because they're prepared for those questions. Tell me about a time when uh, I got asked by a chairman of the board conflict. one time, you know, when we, have you ever sacked anybody? It's like, yeah, of course, I'll go through that. But, yeah, mm. you, you expect certain questions. Yeah, and then when you talk to them, you realise what they are as people. They might be, a, you know, a shallow, narcissistic wreck. Um, <laughs> or they might Surely be you don't have any of those, do you? <laughs> oh. um, or they might be roles. just a wonderful... Um, uh, empathetic leader that is just right for a business that needs its um, people uh, to have their arms, you know, or someone wrap their arms around them. Mm -hmm. You're the person for this. Yeah. And the next person might be a weapon. Great, but this isn't the business for you. I've got another business for you that actually that needs, needs someone it. to come in with a Take sharp edge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. And so the fit is, is really important. And it's really hard sometimes because – I'm not hiring them. And so, yeah. you know, I get to the end of a process and the client says, oh, I've really decided it's going to be B. And you go, oh, I want to you to do A. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I thought I had a real shot there. Um, so, you look, it, 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 but in the end, uh, it's, it's, it's their hire. Uh, yeah. All we can do is advise them about what we think are all the, the pieces of the puzzle. Mm. And, of course, over time, I've been around at time, so, you know, I've seen people's careers. I've mm. seen the mistakes they've made. <laughs> I am still staggered that, you know, there's some people still getting, you know, high-profile jobs. And I was going, wow. there's a tornado <laughs> behind them. It's just yeah, a yeah. litany of, yeah. of disaster. But no one asks them about the trail mm. anyway. Yeah, well. so, yes, so there's another question I've got to ask you as well, because, I mean, it's not just you in this business. So you've got a whole bunch of people in Christchurch in Auckland working with you. Um, how have you gone about finding the right people for your business and what sort of training do they get? Because mm. I've been guilty in the past. We talk about delegate and elevate in EOS. That means that, you know, mm. make sure that you're only doing the stuff you're really great at and love or really good at and like and, and delegate the rest. There's a difference between delegation and abdication. I'm really good at abdication. I don't want to do that. You just get that sorted out and don't give them the, the time and the, the energy to actually train them. And I'm getting better as I recognize it. But um, tell me a little bit about your how you yeah, brought I've, people on board? I've, I've made lots of mistakes <laughs> yeah. myself. Yeah. Um, so I I thought that 
um, you needed someone with a presence and someone who could sell the business you know when they were there and and therefore were were a manifestation of yourself going mm. through there but but really and, and you and I had mentioned this earlier on I think that the most too many people have small ears and big mouths so the the best people are found in this business are people who are confident not arrogant yep. who are listeners rather than talkers but overall a business curious mm -hmm. if you're curious then you'll ask the next question yep. about the business or about the person mm. now if you've got a form that says here's the five questions anyone can ask the five questions but yep. what if halfway through question two a person hesitates and your brain goes there's something here yeah I'll ask another question about that in a slightly different way because there's something going on. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like reference check. We do, when we do reference checks, most people, if they're a referee, they don't want to say anything bad about the no. person, but it's a bit like Hansel and Gretel. They'll drop the breadcrumbs, and if mm. you pick them up, they'll tell you. Yep. And so the worst thing you can do in a reference check is, is have a form and have your head down filling out a form and not listening for those things because they'll say things that will put a pause in or they'll say probably and, and yeah. other sort of qualifying words and you go, hang on, there's a story here. Can can you tell me a little bit more about that? And then mm -hmm. they'll tell you the real deal. Yep. So that's that curiosity. I, I, I like to hire people who are curious mm -hmm. and who – Every new person um, that we bring into the business is is a drain, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but but just energy required to get a new person in and in the team and going through takes energy out of me and other people. So you've got to be sure that you're investing that in something that's going to produce a return. Yeah. And the way you can, I figure that you can do that is if you get someone who's who's asking you questions and uh, about the business mm -hmm. and about their clients, etc such that when the situation gets tricky with a client, and they'll always have that where they don't offer the money they said they were going to offer or or something else, the person's confident enough to say, hmm, that's not what we agreed. Mm -hmm. Or I'm curious about why you're actually changing track yep. now, what's happened, because something must have happened. Um, and so, yeah, that's that, that's my – then whatever they've got a degree or, or – or an expertise in an area that's all secondary yep. to that. Curious be. child, I love it. Yeah, I think I, I think I was that curious child as a child, and probably even more so as an adult, if I'm honest. <laughs> well, often you find, and if, again, if you're asking about people and and in their families, etc., um, people have had business discussions they didn't know about because it, it was at the dinner table, mm. and their father or their mother was talking about things, and they were used to companies being bandied around or business situations being bandied around. They don't even know it, yeah. but they are a level above people who've never had exposure to business because mm. they've got a, a business psyche already going on in their head. Yeah. Uh, that's in the DNA almost. And it comes back to your wife's sort of um, commercial psychiatry, yeah. psychology. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, if somebody wants to work with you, how would they go about finding you and what does your ideal client look like? Um, so we have a couple of um, brands, Farrah Jamison and Sheffield South Island, mm -hmm. um, going through if you want to work with us. Uh, I think it's – what we won't challenge you. We're not difficult, but we will ask you some questions. If you if you just think if you you, you just want to come to a place and just say you know get me somebody, yep. we're not the right place. But if you want See to have a uh, yeah. discussion about what you want to do and grow, we, we, you know, we're we're probably hopeless in our own profile, etc. About what we do because our clients tend to be just loyal and they use us because we get results. Yeah. Um, we're proud of what we do. Um, but, yeah, jump onto farrahjamison.com. My ugly face is there. Um, more than happy to have a, a coffee. I think it's my duty um, – duty is the wrong word, but I'm in, it's incumbent on me to have coffee with people, and, and I have a lot of coffee with, with candidates and, and the like to just um, – and, and with people who are in other recruitment firms often um, – just to sort of share the sort of growth and the things that they should think about mm -hmm. um, going through, not necessarily becoming joining us, but just because um, when you've been around in 
you know, I've stood still and the world's gone, world's gone round me a few times. Um, there's things you can impart that it's it would be useful for others to learn. Yep. So I feel like if someone wants to have a coffee and to share what um, is going on in their business and whether or not we can help, you can buy, but yeah, I'll have a coffee. <laughs> I love that idea. Hey, look, I feel very grateful that um, I've come across you through um, Ryan having you know come, had you on his podcast. So <laughs> no problem. Really enjoyed our conversation, both out of the podcast room and in the podcast room. Thank you very, very much for your time. Um, really pleasure. appreciate you coming in. All right, nice to meet you. Thank you.